Welcome to Zoo Animal Behaviour and Welfare at Dundee and Angus College in partnership with Camperdown Wildlife Centre. For over the past few months I have been filming and recording the behaviour and welfare of the many species housed here, but in particular the lion-tailed macaques. The function of zoos has changed over recent years. Where they were once a form of entertainment, many have evolved and their primary focus is now education, research and conservation. Zoos must now also abide by current legislation, many of which have been formed around the five freedoms. The five freedoms and zoo legislation. The five freedoms. In 1965, a committee led by Professor Roger Bramble presented an 85 page report on the subject of welfare for livestock. The report outlined that the animals should have the freedom to stand up, lie down, turn around and groom themselves. These later became known as Bramble's Five Freedoms and have been adapted by many different industries including zoos. The Five Freedoms form the basis of current welfare legislation and include the freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury and disease, freedom to express natural behaviour, Freedom from fear and distress. The Zoo Licensing Act 1981. Zoos require a license if they are open to the public seven or more days a year with or without a charge and displaying animals to the public. The aim of this act is to ensure that the animals are provided with an opportunity to express natural behaviours in their enclosures. The local authority is in charge of granting the license and regular inspections are carried out. Premises will be inspected within the first year of opening by a member of the local authority and a veterinary surgeon. Licenses are granted for an additional period of four years and can then be extended to six years on reapplication. Whilst following the zoo licensing laws, collections must also follow the Dangerous Wild Animal Act if the collection houses an animal that falls under the Act. The Dangerous Wild Animal Act 1976 the aim of this Act is to regulate the keeping of certain wild animals. To do this, collections must provide a suitable environment for their animal and have security measures and plans in place to prevent escape. The animal must be supplied with a suitable diet, water and bedding material and steps should be in place to ensure the prevention of disease. The animal must have a private area that is not on display to the public. There must be a member of staff that is firearm trained available. Collections can also request to become a member of BIAZA and EAZA. BIAZA, the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums. To become a BIAZA member, collections must also follow their rules on top of the zoo licensing laws. Collections must maintain the physical and mental health of the animals and have appropriate social interaction. They must participate in managed breeding programs and follow BIAZA's strict policies on euthanasia, as well as maintaining a program of training for staff. They must have a sufficient amount of enclosure space and environmental enrichment for their animals and must also participate in scientific studies. EASA, the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria. To become a member, collections must adhere to EASA's strict policies on the comfort and well-being of the animal and how they manage their social groups. They must encourage natural behaviours and minimise the risk of stereotypical behaviour. The collection must provide appropriate furnishings and enrichment have appropriate mixed exhibits and prevent harm and stress to their animals. Zoos must also abide by regulations set out by DEFRA, which have their own interpretation of the five freedoms. The role of the keeper. The keeper must assist with maintaining enclosures, food prep and public viewing areas to a high standard of hygiene and cleanliness. They must provide appropriate and suitable nutrition and water to the animal and present their food in a way that replicates how they would receive this in the wild. They must learn about their animal and report any health concerns to senior keepers and record any relevant information in a section diary and to Zims if appropriate. As part of the keeper's role, they must also monitor welfare standards and look for indicators of good or poor welfare. Indicators of good and poor welfare standards. Good indicators. Good health such as a clean coat and good gait, good mental health, meaning the animal is displaying natural behaviours, the animal has a clean enclosure and appropriate appetite. Poor indicators. 
the animal is not an appropriate weight, such as over or underweight. The enclosure is unhygienic. This is evidence that it has not been cleaned in a while. The animal is displaying stereotypical behaviour, e.g. pacing or head bobbing, and the animal's coat is not in a good condition. Stereotypical behaviours Stereotypical behaviour is an abnormal behaviour not normally observed in an animal. It can be caused by a number of influences and factors. In herbivores, such as elephants, head bobbing and swaying can be observed. It can be caused by a lack of environmental and mental stimulation. It can be prevented by providing appropriate environmental and mental stimulation in the form of toys, such as logs and tires, or providing food enrichment and star grain feeding times. In carnivores, such as wolves, pacing behaviour can be observed. It can be caused by a lack of mental stimulation and feeding at permanent feeding times. It can be prevented by staggering feeding times throughout different times of the day and introducing starved days to animals that would not normally catch prey every day in the wild. Hiding and scattering food in different places or hanging food on ropes to provide more mental stimulation can also prevent this behaviour. In lion-tailed macaques, overgrooming young can be observed. It can be caused by stress, which is caused by a change in their environment. To prevent this, you can provide enrichment in the form of ropes, trampolines and climbing platforms, or scatter feeding food to replicate their diet in the wild, which will provide a distraction to the primate. Hand rearing and stereotypical behaviours Hand rearing an animal might cause the animal to imprint on the human that has been hand rearing it, the same way it would on its mother naturally. This might cause the animal to show aggression towards animals of the same species, preventing it from being introduced into a group. It also may not have learned natural wild behaviours such as hunting as it would normally learn this from its mother or the group it lives in within the wild. If the animal is female, in the future that same animal could reject its own young as it has not learned maternal behaviour from its own mother. The lion-tailed macaque is an old world monkey found in the western Nats of South India. They are one of 23 species of macaques and are classed as endangered on the IUCN red list. They are arboreal animals and spend the majority of their lives in the upper canopy of tropical moist evergreen forests. They are a territorial animal and will live in hierarchical groups of 10 to 20 animals with few males and many females. There is normally one dominant male in the group. Their numbers are currently decreasing in the wild due to the destruction of their habitat through timber harvests and the creation of exotic plantations. They are also popular animals in the illegal pet trade. In the wild, lion-tailed macaques forage for a variety of different foods including leaves, shoots, seeds, insects, bird eggs and small lizards. In the wild, 57.5% of their diet comes from fruit and seeds, 37.3% comes from vertebrates and invertebrates, while only 5.2% comes from other plant parts that include nectar and resin. Their diet is dominated by plant parts such as fruit and seeds. These are rich in sugars but poor in protein. Due to this, they have to rely on vertebrates and invertebrates for their protein. This species of macaque are more dependent on these types of proteins than any other macaque species. Lion tails have special cheek pouches where they will store their food, and they mostly will forage for food in the canopy and rarely leave the treetops. They will spend an average 10.5 hours of their day foraging. As they spend a majority of their day foraging, this must be replicated in captivity. This can be done by scatter feeding certain foods to encourage the macaques to forage. It can also be done through providing food enrichment in the form of a puzzle box or hanging food from trees to encourage the foraging behaviour. Although in the wild their diet contains a high proportion of fruit, it is not recommended to feed high quantities of fruit in captivity as cultivated fruit usually contains less protein and fibre but more sugars in comparison to wild fruit. Due to this, it is recommended to feed more vegetables with insects as part of their main diet with fruit given occasionally. Planting shrubs and foliage in the macaque enclosure will also encourage them to forage for natural food. Behaviour and welfare In order to monitor the welfare and behaviour of the lion-tailed macaques over a long period of time, I recorded their behaviour on several ethograms and their welfare on several welfare record sheets. Both of these types of recording welfare and behaviour can help determine if there is an issue within a group and can identify potential behavioural problems and areas that may need improved within their enclosure. Areas of welfare I was monitoring on the welfare sheets included all aspects of the five freedoms. The only areas that may needed to be addressed were the frayed ropes in the enclosure, however keepers were aware of this, and the macaques enrichment. Although enrichment is provided in the enclosure, it has not been changed since I began recording the welfare sheets 
meaning the macaques may have become habituated with the enrichment. However, to enter the enclosure, the dominant male Guinness must be locked in the indoor house for both the safety of the keeper and the macaques. Locking the macaques away for even a short period of time may cause unnecessary stress, which is why the enrichment may not have changed. For the ethogram, I monitored several different behaviours that the lion tails display. This included foraging, vocalisation, aggression and grooming. While recording the ethograms, I discovered that while the macaques do display foraging behaviour, it was not as frequent as those recorded in the wild. Due to this, I decided that the enrichment I would implement into their enclosure would try to increase the frequency of their foraging behaviour. For the macaques enrichment, I decided to create a large puzzle box. The aim of this puzzle box was to increase the macaques foraging behaviour. During past ethograms, I had noticed that the macaques had started to show more aggression towards each other. I linked this to the fact that some of the females were coming into season and had to keep this in mind when planning the enrichment. As seen from the rough plans of the enrichment, there was to be two sliding doors at opposite ends of the box and two drawers at the other opposite ends of the box. Climbing blocks would also be added to the front of the box. The puzzle box was to be hung in the outside enclosure to replicate the macaque's natural behaviour of foraging in the trees. When building began on the puzzle box with help from the joinery department, we realised we could not source wood large enough for the box and therefore had to make the box smaller than originally planned. As the macaques were showing small amounts of aggression already, I did not want this to increase, therefore it was decided to make another piece of enrichment. This was to be a climbing ladder for the macaques. To encourage the macaques to forage, food such as fruit, seeds and insects were placed in the drawers and cupboards of the box. Mixed in with the food was wood shavings to allow the macaques to further forage for their food. Fresh lemon juice was rubbed onto the ropes of the puzzle box and lemon and vanilla essence was rubbed onto the climbing blocks of the puzzle box. The second piece of enrichment was hung beside the puzzle box. Perfume was also sprayed onto the frames climbing blocks. This was to provide the macaques with new scents.
The enrichment was a success and the macaque's forage of behaviour did increase as shown by the graph. The lowest percentage of time the macaque spent foraging was 6% before the enrichment was placed in the enclosure. This increased to 37% after the enrichment was introduced. There was also little to no aggression shown amongst the macaques. The enrichment strategy had positive effects on the macaque's welfare, as not only did it increase their foraging behaviour, but provided them with something new and entertaining that helped provide a more stimulating environment.